Acts chapter 17 in your Bibles tonight. And we are going to really conclude the passage of Scripture we were in two weeks ago. And I believe it's an important portion of Acts, it's an important transition area that we're in, that uh, it's important for us to understand the circumstances and the things that are moving. Did I say 17? I meant to say 18. I said 17, didn't I? Yes. Yeah, very good. Well, I'm keeping with my, you know, my current trend, which is to announce the wrong uh, text every single time, and so I haven't broken with it. I've got a regular streak running here, and hopefully I'll set some kind of a new record for being wrong in consecutive number of times or whatever. So, um, only someone like me can appreciate that. You all probably don't. But if I lose my humor on top of my memory, we're going to have serious problems. So, you know, I mean... Can you imagine what a grouch I'd be, Brother Al, if I lost my humor and my memory? I wouldn't even be able to pick on you. I'd, we'd just be sitting around griping about things. And boy, what a, what a way to live, huh? Well, not that Brother Al sits around griping about things. That's kind of how that came out, didn't it? <laughs> okay, moving on. He didn't pick on me, so uh, you can scratch that one from the record. He didn't start that one. So here we are, Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. <clears throat> And uh, we want to pick up in in verse 12. I'm going to read from verse 12 down to uh, verse 17. And that will be the area that we're looking at for our text this evening. Okay, so here we are, verse 12, Acts 18. When Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judge. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of those things. <laughs> okay, let's pray, and then we'll summarize and make application. Father, thank you for the scripture, and Lord, thank you for the turn of events, the circumstances, even in Paul's life, where at a time when he needed encouragement, and at a time when, it, in a sense, he needed shelter and a respite, that he found that in God. And thank you that you showed your hand to be a merciful hand even in the turning of the king's heart in this circumstance. And I pray that as we look at these matters tonight, the Lord, you'll help us to see and understand the times in which we live, as well, Father, to understand what your will is at all times. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So two weeks ago, not last Wednesday because we were away at teen camp, but two weeks ago, we were in Acts chapter 18, and we were looking at this phase, this period of time in Paul's life, and really a period of time when God was preparing him for prison ministry. A time in life when God was restoring Paul, uh, nourishing him. I almost see it, it's not a parallel, the scripture doesn't refer to it as such, but I almost see it as an Elijah time. Remember after Elijah prophesied against the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and had this enormous victory, and Jezebel said, God do so to me and more also, if I don't have your the head of your head tomorrow, you're going to be dead tomorrow, Elijah. And after this moral, spiritual victory that Elijah won, in which the children of Israel chose God instead of Baal, and helped to slay the prophets of Baal, Elijah turned tail and fled, ran, was, um, uh, was literally just famished, was out in the wilderness without food, and God went to him and nourished him and restored him. And then God had him to go and to prophesy that the king, I, I always mix up whether Syria or Syria, uh, prophesy that the king would and Jehu would be the ones that would now be the ones that would be used to overthrow Jezebel. And he told him to anoint prophet Elisha in his place. And so God used him, prepared him for ministry for a next phase in his journey. And here in the text this evening, we find a very similar kind of a circumstance in Paul's life. Paul literally has been bellyachered for his entire ministry. And when Paul first got saved and he went to Jerusalem, the first thing he did was what God had told the believers that he would do, which was that he would preach the gospel. He would preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to the Jews and to those that are in the palaces. 
and he would be used effectively for the preaching of the gospel. And so he came to Jerusalem, and he began to dispute with the dispute with the uh, Greeks, and it caused a stir. And the Jewish the Jews got so mad about it that they ended up having Paul leave. And Paul wasn't back at Jerusalem for a large space of time, literally in the teens of years, and was shelved in his ministry. We don't a lot of times remember this time that God took and really taught the Apostle Paul, but also that time when Paul was out of fellowship with the apostles at Jerusalem. And they had rest at Jerusalem because Paul wasn't there. But when the believers got saved at Antioch and the Gentiles began to be saved, Barnabas went and got Paul and brought him to Antioch, and God again restored him to the ministry. And Paul had had a good relationship again and, and was being used of the Lord. But ever since Paul began preaching the gospel to the Gentiles and to the Jews, and by the way, he would always preach the gospel to the Jews first when he'd go to any Gentile city. He would go down to the synagogue or go down to the river where the Jews met, and he would contend with them and try to win them. And what would happen every time? Well, people would believe, and then those who didn't believe would be stirred up, they'd be angry, and they would cause trouble, and they'd try to kill Paul. And he'd be off. He'd be driven out of town. They'd either throw rocks at him until they thought he was dead, or they'd try to kill him, and he'd get let down out of the city by over the basket, you know, by over the wall in a basket. Or Paul would escape with his very life. He'd preach the gospel in the next city, and the same thing would happen over and over and over again. Until the point when Paul uh, said, after being... Uh, when, uh, until the point when... Paul said in verse 6 of chapter 18 he, to the Jews that wouldn't believe uh, in Corinth, he said, Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean from henceforth. I will go into the Gentiles. In other words, he said, I'm done having ministry with Jews. He decided that Jews don't receive the gospel well. He overlooked all those who do receive the gospel. He focused on those who don't receive the gospel and persecute him. And he said, basically... You can go to hell if you wish to. Your blood's on your own hands. I'm going to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And he said, forget you. Fooly on you guys. And he went and stayed with a guy named Justice. And Justice House was adjoined to a synagogue. And the leader of this synagogue there was a man by the name of Crispus who uh, worshipped God. and uh, or I'm sorry, who uh, believed on the Lord with all his house. So Paul said, I'm done preaching to the Jews went to a guy in his house was joined to a synagogue, stayed with him, and the, the, the ruler of the synagogue, Justice, got saved in his whole house. Now, what's a, what would be a synagogue leader? What, what, what ethnicity would he be? He would be Jewish, right? Yeah, he would be Jewish. He would be like a rabbi or a teacher in the synagogue, but he's a Jew. So Paul said, I'm done preaching to the Jews. And he was Jewish. I'm tired of all the opposition. If you want to go to hell, you can just go to hell. And then he goes to, a, to stay with Justice, and Justice's house is, is adjoined to a synagogue, and the man Crispus there comes to Paul and says, tell me about Jesus. Well, you're not going to want to hear it, but here you go. And he shares the gospel with Crispus, and Crispus tells his family, y'all got to hear this. Crispus became a believer, and his house became a believer. Everybody got saved. The whole synagogue got saved after Paul said Jews don't get saved. Sunday morning, did anybody notice we had a Jewish man here? Sunday, you know he got saved. Amen. Uh, Jews get saved. They get the saved the same as anyone else gets saved. Did you know Amen. that? Amen. It, it, just, it, it, it kills me. It frustrates me sometimes the attitude that believers have toward Jewish ministry. If a person is in Judaism, obviously they're not a believer of Jesus Christ. But just because they're Jewish doesn't mean they can't believe in Jesus like anyone else can. And if you'll remind yourself, the church came from Jerusalem and it came from being the gospel being preached by Jews whom Paul was a Jew. <clears throat> and the idea, well, Jews don't get saved. That's nonsensical, my friend. People who have a heart to believe and to know the truth get born again. Amen. And the gospel is the same. And we don't preach it differently. Paul didn't preach. Paul was done preaching to the Jews. And yet here's a man that heard the gospel and got saved in spite of that. The Lord came to Paul at night and in a vision, and God told Paul some things. And I, I, I want to read that in verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Do you remember when Elijah said, I'm all alone, there's no one else in Israel, believes in God, and God said, I've got 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And here Paul is, and 
He's in Athens. He left Athens and came to Corinth. And he says, I'm all alone, just a bunch of unbelieving Jews and a bunch of pagan Gentiles. And God said, I've got much people in this city. And God was taking care of Paul. Now I want to remind you that God is good and gracious even when it would seem that we don't deserve it. Amen. I know God's been very good to me a number of times when the fact of the matter is I'm, a, I'm too much of a crybaby. And I'll just tell you something. I, I don't like a crybaby myself, and I don't like me when I'm a crybaby either. Yeah, but you know, sometimes we have these times in our life when we focus <clears throat> not on the good things God has done, but we focus on the things that are wrong. As though God cannot do anything about those things which are wrong. And Paul has God Himself come to him in a vision and say to him, don't you be afraid because I've got things under control in life. And friend, I have to say to you tonight that if you'll walk in fellowship with God, you'll accomplish, you'll fulfill His purpose in your life, which is to preach the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. God's in control. Amen. And the circumstances of life can be good or they can be ill. You know, it's interesting that in my short lifetime, I, I know my age, so I keep saying it over and over again so I can remember it. I'm 38 years old. And in my short lifetime, and I do believe it's short compared to some of y'all, uh, I'm looking at the wall back there. I don't know who I'm referencing. Okay. In my short lifetime, I have seen times change. And that's really a fact. You know, when I was born, my parents used to terrify me by telling me what to do when the authorities came to arrest us for being Christians. Uh, but the thing about it is that people were being arrested for being Christians when I was a child. We were, we were in a Christian school, and that was illegal in our state, in the state of Kansas. And so... The, uh, we happened to live in Salina where the superintendent of the public schools was aware of us, did not approve of us, but um, kind of left us alone. But we were always in danger of the SRS, which would be the Kansas version of the uh, HRS, coming and arresting my parents for not putting us in a public school. Did you know that was illegal when I was a kid in the state of Kansas, Nebraska? A whole bunch of preachers in Nebraska went to jail for quite a period of time and then and some folks in Michigan marched on the Capitol there and in, in uh, the, the mansion, the, or the, uh, what do they call it, the governor's mansion in Michigan. A lot of things happened in the 1980s. And we subsequently got religious freedom to have Christian education. But we didn't have that when I was born. Did you know that? My parents used to tell me, this is what you do if they come for you. And the thing is, we knew people that came for us. Pretty terrifying to a child, by the way. <laughs> don't, try, don't scare your children more than they need to be frightened. But uh, that was a reality. Uh, it was illegal when we when when I was a kid, or it was it was debated, and people were being arrested for uh, corporal punishment, which you know, I don't know, a lot of people know what that means, but it means spanking for spanking your children. And the Bible says that uh, you're supposed to you know spank your children. Proverbs is pretty specific about that. It's specific about how to do it as well. It's not to not to abuse your children, but to spank them. But that was illegal when I was a kid. And you know something? Laws passed in the late 1980s and the late 1990s where Christians were allowed to send their kids to public to Christian schools and where Christians were allowed to homeschool and where Christians were allowed to discipline their children uh, in a non-abusive way but as the Bible teaches. Okay, now you say, well, pastor, what of it? Well, then I remember around 2000, the year 2000, uh, there was some landmark legislation granting religious freedom in our country. Uh, I remember going to a, a, a CLA seminar and uh, being really encouraged by some of the laws that had passed, which, by the way, so many of them are still in the books, granting religious freedom. For instance, uh, there are laws that would say in our country that if you can talk about anything at work and it's a mutual conversation, in other words, a person wants to talk, if you can talk about football or basketball or if you can talk about, I don't know, you know hobbies or interests, you can also talk about religious things. So you could talk about Jesus with your coworkers, And if somebody told you at work that you could not talk about Jesus, in other words, it had to be consensual. If somebody said, I don't want to talk to you about that. Well, then you, you can't talk to somebody about something they don't want you to talk about. But if at work you want to share the gospel with someone and they want to talk to you about it, then you have the right. My wife had a job when I was in seminary in Pensacola. She had a job cleaning a church, and she got put together, partnered up with a woman who was into the Wiccan, uh, which is, you know, it's a cult. She was a Wiccan, so she was a witch. And uh, she was, the, the, this lady was upset. She was talking about how in the public schools that they had outlawed 
uh, black magic and they or they how that they weren't allowing in the schools for in in Santa Rosa County for people to do basically witchcraft and she was saying what a terrible thing that was and my wife said no that's a good thing and because she said that was a good thing the girl went back and said I don't want to work with her because you know she's trying to shove religion and Christianity down me and and my wife got fired for just saying, hey, you know, I disagree. I don't think we should have her kids learning witchcraft. You know, in other words, a woman voiced her opinion. My wife voiced an opposing opinion. Well, I went into to the work, and I took some legal things. I took some laws, and I showed the lady that what she had done was a major violation, major religious discrimination. And I told her, I said, legally, you're in a lot of trouble right now. The lady checked into it. She said, oh, we're in a lot of trouble. And uh, she made things right. And, you know, you don't really want your job back when they fired you for being a Christian. But uh, she made things right. She apologized for it. And then a week later called and begged my wife to come back to work there again. And, and the situation was handled. Had they, not, uh, had they not responded the way they did, we had legal recourse. It was religious discrimination, which is the same as sexual, uh, sexual harassment or, um, or uh, racial discrimination at the workplace. And so that is the gamut of what I've seen in my short lifetime. I was born when it was illegal for us to homeschool or go to Christian school. And then when I first you know, got in the ministry around uh, 2000 or the, around that time frame, there were landmark banner religious rights that we had as believers. And it was pretty good times. And then in this past couple of years, we've seen Christians who own businesses told that if they don't make cakes for homosexuals, uh, then they have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars and go out of business. And then this past year, our Supreme Court told us, uh, told us that pastors have the right to preach the Bible and say that homosexuality is a sin, but lay people don't have the right to believe it. You know, it's really interesting. I, I went to a legal seminar a while back with a pretty well-known Christian organization that defends ministries and so forth. I'm going somewhere with this, I hope you know. Okay, and uh, it was interesting. They said, preachers, you just, don't you worry about it. You're covered. There is legislation that says you have the right to preach your conscience. And my thought the whole time was, yeah, but what about the legislation that says you all have the right to believe what the Bible says is preached? In other words, I can preach whatever I want to, but you can't believe it. And you're the I, the pastor doesn't own the church. They want to shut churches down. They're going to come after you. They're not going to come after me. They just say, you know, he's a loony. He's a wacko. Who believes everything the Bible says. You know, and they're going to go after. They're going to target individuals and persecute individuals. Well, I'm not trying to frighten or scare anyone. What I want to say to you tonight is that, you know, God is working when times are bad, and God is working when times are good. And right now, Paul is at a place where, humanly speaking, he just can't handle it anymore. And he's gotten to the place where he said, I'm not preaching the gospel of Jews anymore. And the truth of the matter is, Paul couldn't handle it anymore. Physically speaking, he was depleted, and God restored him. And God made him a promise. He said, you're going to have peace in this city. I have a lot of people here, and you're going to be fine. And here in our text this evening that we read, we see a test of it. We see a rather um, comical a comical, ironic outcome to a situation. In verse uh, 12, the Bible says, when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul. Okay, now didn't God promise Paul he wasn't going to have problems? He did. He did. He said, in verse 10, he said, I'm with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Isn't that what God said? then what is happening when these Jews in one accord, I mean they have unity, they've unified with an insurrection, they've taken him in verse 12 before Gallio and they've brought him to the judgment seat. Now let me just tell you how this happened. Charlie, you ready? Awake? Ready for this? Okay, Charlie's going to be Paul and I'm going to be one of the um, unbelieving Jews in the city. And so, um, you know, hey Charlie, would you like to go with me to the judgment seat? Not particularly. Not particularly. That's what Paul would have said. No, thank you. Okay. Come on, buddy. I don't care if you want to go. You just get there, you know? Okay, I kicked him. I really did. Okay, so, all right. Paul didn't voluntarily go to the judgment seat. Do you see this in the text? In other words, all the Jews came in a mob and they dragged him there. And they had no right to do so. You can go sit down if you like to. Thanks for coming up. <laughs> all right. 
<laughs> okay, so now, <laughs> you've never been brought to the judgment seat before, have you? So, oh, man, yeah. that's a bummer. All right. Well, so now, God told Paul that he's not going to have problems. Didn't that what God said? Well, he said, I have much people in this city, and uh, no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. And yet they dragged him before the judgment seat. And my friend, I don't know about you, but were I Paul, and were you Paul, wouldn't you be wondering in your mind a little bit about whether or not God told you the truth? Truth is, things look glum right now. They look bad. Paul's been here before. He's been dragged before the judgment seat before. And, and he's been beaten illegally at the judgment seat. He's been imprisoned illegally. And in Paul's mind, I don't know about you, but I think Paul had a little PTSD. It happens, doesn't it? You ever had something terrible happen and circumstances similar to that happened again? And you got PTSD? I wasn't really much of a believer until I had my boat wreck a couple years ago. And this is kind of funny to me because I'm not a fearful person. I'm not... For years of my life, I just have not been afraid of much of anything or anyone. I just don't worry a lot. I don't fear a lot. But I got in a boat accident, some of you all know, a couple years ago on a Sunday afternoon, Anthony and Charlie. And there's just three of us, right, in the boat. And we got hit. Charlie and I got hurt pretty badly. And we were, we were, you know, pretty well incapacitated. And Charlie was looking pretty, you know, I, it, it was pretty nip and tuck with his leg for a while there. So we were both in pretty bad shape from it. And... Um, we got a little better. I got on a boat again. I, I, it wasn't the boat's fault. A jet skier hit us. He came flying under a bridge and slammed into us. And he was, he was the guy was a maniac. I don't know if he's on drugs or what was wrong with him, but he wasn't right. He wasn't normal. And he got hurt. I'm not afraid of boats. Just because we got in a boat accident, we both got hurt pretty badly. Charlie worse than me. He went off the boat, hit the bridge, went underwater, hit his head, and got his leg mangled, his head hit. And we didn't even know how badly we were hurt. We just knew we were hurt badly. And we really found out later on how bad it was. And uh, so a couple of, I don't know, six months later, I was in another boat, and I was taking some, uh, some interns, our summer interns, for a ride, and some Pastor McClure's kids in Delray Beach for a boat ride. And uh, we, we put in uh, down at, uh, at at boat ramp, uh, George English Park, whatever it was. And we went to go underneath a bridge, and the craziest thing happened to me. I've never had this happen before. When we went to go under the bridge, I'm telling you, I just got like, I felt like I was panicking. Like I couldn't breathe. And all this adrenaline went to my stomach. Like when you get injured, you get this adrenaline that goes to your stomach and it kind of helps your body, I guess, to keep you conscious if you're in a dangerous situation. But all this crazy stuff started happening to me. Just like I got sick to the stomach and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm driving the boat. Going under piloting a boat, right? You pilot boats, you pilot airplanes and boats, you drive cars. So I'm piloting the boat and I'm trying to go under a bridge. Water's running pretty fast under it. And I am literally just scared silly. I told Sean, who's in the military, I said, Sean, I feel like I just, I just, I'm, I just was terrified a minute ago. And I thought it was funny because it's funny that I was afraid. I wasn't afraid when I got in the accident. wasn't afraid when I was hurt. wasn't afraid later on. But when I went underneath a bridge, which is where I got hit at, I, got, I, got, I was frightened. And Sean said, that's PTSD. He said, you have post-traumatic stress <clears throat> disorder. He said, that's what happens to every guy that's been in combat. Whenever they hear a gunshot or whenever they hear a yell or a noise or whatever, all of a sudden, just their body just starts preparing itself for danger. And he said, that's, exactly, that's the same thing that's happening to you. And I thought it was kind of ironic that it happened in a boat accident. But can you imagine Paul being dragged to the judgment seat? Do you think maybe he had some feelings, some here-we-go-again emotions? I mean, it had happened to him so many times and he was sick of it. And I can imagine being dragged to the judgment seat and I can just think Paul had to have been like, oh, going to jail, going to prison. I'm going to be beaten tonight. Probably some of my bones are going to be broken. This is probably going to happen. He was probably just literally sick. And I can imagine Paul thinking, God told me I was safe in this city. God told me I was going to be all right. And you, you could sense it. You could sense the betrayal in a sense. You could sense that Paul feels like God told me this wouldn't happen, and it's happening. And I guarantee you that it was a testing of his faith. I promise you that for Paul, this circumstance, he didn't have an unclear remembrance of what God had said. 
Paul had this vision and he didn't keep it a secret, we know, because Luke wrote it down. So Paul had told people, he had really uh, told people, this is what God said is going to happen. And literally everything that Paul thought God said, he feels like now, well, either God didn't mean what he said, or I didn't understand what God said, or what God said isn't true. And then we read the outcome of this circumstance. And we're going to see here that God is in this instance preparing Paul for his next transition. You know where Paul's going, right? Just a few chapters, Paul's on his way to prison. And so he's going to jail, and he's, he's going for the final one. He's going to Rome. He's going to Jerusalem on his way there, and the Holy Spirit's preparing him. I just want to tell you something, friend. When God gives you a peaceful time in your life, it is not necessarily so that you have peace. Oftentimes, it's because God is preparing you for the next thing. But God had made a promise to Paul, and He's going to let Paul know that he is still on the throne. He's still in control. So in verse 14, when Paul was now about to open his mouth, their, their accusation was, this fellow persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law. In other words, they're trying to say, he broke the law. And that's always the accusation. Ah, he did wrong. He tried to accuse you for preaching the gospel of doing wrong. Broke the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O oh, you Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. Gallio stands up. He's a man who does not know God. He does not know Paul. But God uses Gallio. God has Paul's about to say, Well, listen, here's the deal. I didn't break the law. And he's about to defend himself. He's about to speak for himself. And before he does, Gallio says, Everybody shut up. If it were a matter of wicked lewdness, if he'd done something criminal, it'd be one thing. But the fact is, is that that's your law, that's not my law, and I don't want to hear it. And that's what Gallio said to them. He says, you judge him yourself. You're talking about your... Religion, you're not talking about law. I had this happen one time. Uh, I miss living in a condo, I honestly do. My wife and I bought, when we first moved to Florida, we lived in our, in our RV for a year, and then we, we bought a condo in a 55 and older community, and that was like during 2006, 7. We knew better than to buy property uh, that, that uh, when the market was just crazy high. We knew better to buy a place to live when it was, because we knew it would lose value. So we bought a condo in a 55 and older community, and you legally can do that. And Florida law says that 20% of the people in the community can be under 55. And the community didn't have 20%. They had something like 12 or 15%. So they couldn't stop us from buying it. But the people there were not very glad to have youngsters living among them. We were the quietest people in there, honestly. We were. We didn't party. We didn't drink. They all did. You know, we were the quietest ones there. But sometimes they were mean. And there was a guy, and he was... He was, he was perverted. He was in a perverse lifestyle. And uh, we were kind to every person there. And that's the truth. Our neighbors would tell you that. But this guy was a troublemaker. And he did something illegal. He got in my truck. He, 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 they, they, they were renting parking spaces for $25 a month. But there was a lady who wasn't there and wasn't using her parking space. And she said, you can use mine for free. And she gave me her, her sticker. So I put the sticker in my truck. This got this guy so mad that I got a free parking spot. He got so angry about it, it really bothered him, that he got in my truck and took my sticker out. So, I went to him, and I said, somebody took my sticker out, and he said, I did. And I said, well, could I have it back? <laughs> you know, I'm just thinking, you know, it's not normal to get in somebody's car or truck, you know, somebody, you don't know them, you get in and take things out of it, that's illegal. And so I said, can I have it back? And he said, Puh. Yeah, you know, and it just, you know, no, I'm not giving it back. So I, so I called the, the sheriff. The sheriff showed up, and this man was the president of our association. Because he's a, he was just, you know, anybody here know what a condo Nazi is? He was a condo Nazi, okay? So he is president of our association, and the sheriff came, and he was a little surprised. I mean, I didn't have a recourse. I had to get my sticker back. So I had to call the sheriff. He wouldn't give it to me. And uh, I couldn't take it from him by force. That's illegal. So... I called the sheriff, and when the sheriff came up, he said, this man has broken every law in our community to me. And the sheriff said, condos don't have laws. They have rules. And he said, 
And I'm thinking, what law have I broken? What rule have I broken? I comply with all the rules. He said he's broken every every law in our community. And the sheriff said, I don't want to hear it. Their the condos don't have laws. And the, I mean, the man just he is just out. I mean, just completely out of control. Turning red, beat red. And the sheriff said, you're going to jail. You don't calm down. You're going to jail. You need to calm yourself down. You got in this man's vehicle and you stole something from him. You broke the law. It was very similar to Gallio in this instance. These people are coming, he's broken all the laws! And Gallio said, your religion isn't a law. And you don't get to enforce it here in Corinth. So, I don't have any time for you. And here Paul is. He's going through his PTSD and his anxiety. And that's imagined, by the way. That's not necessarily so, but I, you think he's anxious? He was so anxious he was done preaching the gospel to the Jews. He's going through, his, he's going through all this emotion and all these things. And Gallio said, I don't have any time for you. He said, it's a question of your words and names, and if you're law lucky to it, but I will be no judge for such matters. And the Bible says he drove them from the judgment seat. He said, get out of here. Get out of here. And he pushed them all. They brought Paul in, and, and Gallio sent them out. Then the Bible says, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes and the chief ruler of the synagogue. Now, this, is, this shouldn't be funny, but it's funny. I'm sorry about this. I'm sorry that I'm laughing, but it's because I'm a Generation X or not a millennial. So bear with me here. Gallio... I'm sorry, the Greeks took Sosthenes and the chief ruler of the synagogue and beat him before the judgment seat. So Sosthenes and all these Jews that were unbelievers took Paul and dragged him into the judgment seat and Gallio said, get out of here. I don't have time for this. You're nonsense. And the Greeks said, and we don't like you anyway. And they took Sosthenes in front of the judgment seat and they gave him the beating that he planned on giving Paul. And Paul went home. Now don't get mad at me for being happy about Sosthenes getting a beating. Okay, don't get angry at me. He deserved it. How do I know he deserved it? Because God made it happen. That's how I know. God did it. If you don't think God was in control of these circumstances, my friend, you misunderstand who your God is. Right. And now Paul is about to have a transition ministry because he's going to go back to Ephesus on his way back to Jerusalem. And he's about to be bound and in prison and shipwrecked. And he's about to endure hardship so that he can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ at Rome. Right here, God is preparing Paul's heart. He's working in his life circumstances that are going to give him the courage when they say to him at Ephesus, and they bind him and they say, Thus shall it be if you go to Jerusalem. And he says, What mean you to break my heart? <laughs> Ain't scared. I'm not afraid. I've been beaten before. I'm already bound by the Spirit of God. And this is how God dealt with his fear. My friend, I want to tell you something. Sometimes it may be that individuals will try to persecute, and God won't allow it. God will stop it. And you know, I believe that most of the time the reason is because you couldn't bear it. And God, by His grace, is only going to allow as much as you can bear. But God will be preparing you for hard times. He'll be preparing you for a ministry that exceeds what you would have been able to bear. If you were to take Paul, can you imagine taking Paul when he came to Corinth and the Jews were so opposing him that he said, I'm not preaching the gospel anymore. And you were to send him back to Jerusalem on his way to Rome. Can you imagine Paul being willing to do that? No. So what is God working on here in, in Corinth? He's working on the heart of Paul. And sometimes in your life, my friend, you're going through circumstances and you may not be able to identify or diagnose them. And you may even be in circumstances where you're saying, God promised me that I wouldn't have to and my friend, I'll just tell you something. God does not break His promise. God keeps His word. 
And if God has given you a promise in His Word, God showed you something, you know it to be true, cling to it, hang to it, because you can believe God. Amen. Even if you're on the way to the judgment seat. And that is precisely the turn of events that Paul found himself at as God is preparing him for imprisonment and for a different kind of criticism and a different kind of ministry. Father, thank You for what we've learned this evening. I ask You to help us to absorb it and, Lord, to apply it in our lives as we need it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to take some prayer requests at this time.